So I'm with uh, Deborah Ames, who is a co-op member at the Arts League of Lowell, 307 Market Street, Lowell, oh, Massachusetts. <laughs> and uh, we're at her, uh, where she does her pottery work at Purple Sage Pottery in Merrimack, Massachusetts. You come quite a ways to work here. Oh yeah, that was a big decision. <laughs> the side, uh, first of all, I lost my studio in Chumsford because she, the owner, retired. And so... I decided I was had to look around, and I found Purple Sage, which is a community of potters and artists, and we're up in Merrimack, as, as Ed said, and we um, talk to each other and discuss pottery problems and crafting, and there's a shared community here. Yeah. So how long have you been in Lowell as an artist? So you, you have the, your um, co-op? Yeah, I've been involved with Lowell for about probably about 12 years now. And I am the gallery community chairman at right now. So your academic background is in fine arts? Yes. Uh -huh. I had a fine arts degree, and I taught about five or six years before my kids were born. And then uh, made a switch to business world to put them through college. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is pottery a business for you right now? or? It's a very small part. My really focus is, is, is on production rather than product. I'm not too interested, I, I mean, I will make functional pieces, but I'm not too interested in doing mugs and bowls and things like that. Uh, my real focus is uh, slab work, hand building, and sculptural work. I do want to mention that you have a Facebook page at Misty Falls Pottery. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how did you, how did you begin, how did you get started in pottery? Oh, well, first of all, I took ceramics in my undergraduate work, and then I fell in love with it, and but I never was able to have the, town, the, the wherewithal to have a studio in my home. So when I was teaching art, I taught junior high level and I taught high school level. I would always gravitate to the kids who were taking interest in the ceramics. And the advantage of teaching high school is most high schools have kilns and have wheels. And that's where I was starting to get into the pottery. And then I put it aside for many years. I was raising a family and had my own business. And then... When I started to get to retirement age, I looked around what I loved to do, and it was definitely getting back into ceramics. So the other thing I asked you earlier is, are you? do you call yourself a potter? And you don't. You call yourself no. a ceramic artist. Right, because, um, you know, I will do small figurative pieces. I will do large abstract. I tend to work in large abstract, either pots for the patio or parts for your garden um, or sculpture for the garden. Things like that. Like right now, I have during COVID, I was making uh, dragon eggs and carving dragon eggs and doing fun things. Um, I tend to emphasize the creativity end of of, of non-functional pieces, and I'm you know I like to do sculpture mainly. Yeah, so there are all kinds of materials for uh, for ceramic sculpture. What what materials do you use? I mean, it runs everywhere from. My understand. I'm not an expert, so it runs from earthenware to stoneware to porcelain. And this is stoneware we're working here. Um, it's sturdier. It's good for functional work, but it all can be used in sculptural work. Um, I don't use heavily grog clay, but again, again, I choose a clay that has more body to it. I don't like. I don't care for. I don't say I don't like porcelain. I love porcelain pieces. Don't care, care to work in it. So where, where does it where do your ideas come from for for the work that you do? Uh, particularly uh, this. Oh, well, I do a lot of sketching. I have sketchbooks that travel with me all the time. And like I'll be at a um, beach and I'll start looking at shells and things and thinking how they can be made into a sculptural piece. Um, I like uh, a lot of repetition. Like recently, I just did a piece that's called um, Dark Side of the Moon, and it had. Um, 15 crescents in in this piece and it stood, stood about 22 inches high it was at the sculptural show recently and um, uh, So I just use my imagination tend to be contemporary. I don't like um, t Contemporary or ancient for a while there I was doing pieces that were like cave Named after caves and things like that or old ancient civilizations uh as opposed to uh, throwing a piece on a wheel, you prefer working... Yeah, I work in a lot of slab hand-built pieces, and you can do anything 
It can be built, also coil, coil work. I have done coil work. And I can get in a pot very high versus on a wheel. Uh, you have more control on the coil work. On slab work, it, you, it's, it's flat and slab and you're piecing together. It's like a puzzle when you take a sculptural and you have this idea. Uh, my figures I've carved out of a block of clay. Uh, so you can go anywhere when you work with hand building. Uh, uh, but the wheel is the most efficient way to make anything. That's why the wheel was invented. It was efficiency hmm. in mass production. When you start working on a piece, how, how does it start out? How does the coil? All right, well, the first thing is I'm making a slab, and we have what's called a slab roller. And um, uh, I have to prep this clay as far as I'm adding my texture, my, my whatever I want to add to it. It could be dry pieces of clay. You know, I can drag it across gravel. I can do, I can imprint it. So all kinds of ways to texturize and distress a slab of clay. Then at some point, I start tearing the pieces apart or carving them or, or cutting them apart. Then I let them dry in a damp cupboard, uh, maybe about two or three days, until this clay could actually stand up on its own. So if you had a piece like this, it would stand by the time it gets to leather hard. Like for example, there's a stretched piece. Well, I like that, and I'll incorporate that. I'll intentionally stretch it, or I'll intentionally break it. After it gets the leather hard, you can do a lot more with it. But the only place you can stretch it is when it's wet like this. And I can actually take it and hang it over an edge and get a stretch. And so, and then I would build either a functional piece. It could be the outside of a bowl could be anything or a sculptural piece out of this one chunk of clay. And I, so I have these pieces and then I'm piecing them together into my vision, which I've usually sketched. And usually by the time I'm done, it's completely changed from the original idea. <laughs> yeah. uh, so how, after you completely uh, build a piece, how long do you have, how, long's, how long after that do you fire it? Well, it has to be the first firing is a bit that's called bisque firing, which is you get your initial hardness of the clay. And you have to wait till that's bone dry. So you don't have any moisture hidden in it because that can cause, cause um, fractures or explosions. Yes. So you, bisking is first, and then you have to make a decision about the, the color and everything, and then that's a firing, a gas firing. So how do, you, how do you apply the glaze? Because a lot of your pieces oh, have some yeah, nuances of, of color. Yeah, that's I, I do a lot of um, uh, putting glaze on and then removing it. I remove it by, I'll hand rub it, I'll sand it. Um, the advantage of all my texture pieces and my grooves and my dents is that the glaze will go into the, the lower, it'll sink low, and then I'll take a brush and either wet brush it or sponge it off again. So I have a lot of... Um, pieces that have one glaze but has all these levels of that glaze. And so the color changes. So what what are the gla what are the glazes made of? All, all minerals. <laughs> yeah. Minerals, yeah. And uh, from what? Oh, name some <laughs> I can't think of any mineral names. Cobalt. Cobalt, Cobalt would Copper. be the color. Copper, Copper. iron. Um, um, spar. Spar. Spar is a big one. Um, <laughs> That's why I work at a, at, at, a, at, a, at a community, so that they have the answers, and if I don't have them on the top of my brain. Now, usually we pre-mix our glazes. You can see the tubs under here. Um, it's all pre-mixed, and we know our samples, and we can choose from things like this, a whole tray of selections to help us decide. And if we don't like it, we might mix our own. You'll get a chemical... Um, get a, a, a recipe and you could change this but but then you don't have reliability right now this is all reliable colors you're gonna pretty much get what you put on mm, uh, but it can be very like this is my next my son is crazy about orange and i'm going to be using this and uh, this is b and b chino and um uh so our our glazes first of all you're gonna decide if you want matte or gloss that's the first decision and then you go shopping in all these samples. <laughs> and that's, again, an advantage of a community because we make for each other. 
So if one glaze is out, someone's there who will remake it the next month and get a whole nother supply. Not one person's doing all the work. Because a lot of work in the ceramic uh, studio works. So other than the Arts League of Lowell, are you showing any place else? Yes, I've shown at um, the N NEC, which is the Northeast um, Ceramics uh, Education Educators Show. I've uh, shown at, um, oh, I can't remember some of the names, but yeah, I have sent off things by UPS. Um, I hope they arrive safely to shows. Now, do you always get accepted? No, but now we can do video, you know, applications, which has made life a lot better. Uh, so, so you're so not mailing unless you're accepted. And it's a very competitive, um, do I have, I've had some luck, uh, but not great luck. There's a lot of rejections happens in this business. ALL is exclusive for you? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, the co-op is my main function because I also feel at the co-op I'm supporting the art community in, in our in the Lowell area. Uh, and so so if I don't sell for one month, that's okay. You know, I am supporting our gallery, which I, I really feel strongly about. Yeah. Uh, you also participate in hanging the exhibits. Yes, I'm the chairman of the gallery committee, which is a hard job. As fact is, um, next week was well, kind of a fun job because you get to see everybody's work. Uh, but the next week is our turnover week, and I'll put in probably well two eight-hour days, and they're long days. And then we'll have taken, so it might be some hours in between before. Uh, so it's a commitment. The gallery committee is fun because it's. I'm really only busy every once every eight weeks or six weeks, as far as when the chain turns over. Uh, but having that art degree does help because I do know about hanging and I have hung shows before other places. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, you know, it's, again, it's like you already know, Ed, that participating on a committee is a way of getting to know people. And having your hands on, you feel like you're supporting your community. So I would encourage, this is my little pitch, everybody to sign up and volunteer at all, if you at all can, can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really, really appreciate the time. I'm happy I came here to Purple Sage Pottery in Merrimack, yeah. Massachusetts. I hope someone can come, come and visit us. Um, we have a lot of good time. There's classes you can join. Um, you can be a renter like me or just drop into the, to the shop here. Yeah, and for sure, come and see uh, everybody's work at the Arts League of Lowell. Yeah. And uh, Deborah Ames is there, as well as probably up to, I think, around 30 other artists. 30 other art co-op people. And, and we it, all it, have, and we try to change this out. Some people are better than others, but we, we try to keep our, our co-op spots fresh. Yeah, I'm due to freshen mine up. Yeah, too. mine's old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm guilty. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much for the interview. Oh, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Oh, thank you for coming.